Okay. I'll... Great. Hello, everyone. Um, this is the Next Level Debate Strategy Lecture. Um, my name is B. Smail. I'm a grad student um, and coach at Wayne State University. And I will be presenting with Jada. Hello, I am an undergraduate from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and this debate will cover strategic choices that we make inside of the round, before the round, and after the round that give us a better shot at success. All right, without further ado, we'll begin. So first, what is debate strategy? In the most simplistic way I can put it, it is the ability to make choices about arguments in and out of the round confidently for strategic gain. This means that when we are about to approach the debate, what are the thoughts that we have about debate when we are inside of the debate what decisions are we looking for? What signals are we looking for? And after the debate, once the debate has ended, how can we use what just happened to make sure that we are constantly getting better and more prepared? Why is debate strategy important? Oh, yeah. Okay. So first is for preparation. When we have debate tournaments coming up or we know uh, the people in our circuit that we are going to be debating, we want to have an idea of what's happening when we get into the round. We don't want to go into the round blindly or confused. This is also why debate camp is important is because you think about all of these things before the season actually starts and before you have your first tournament. So when we are preparing for debates, we want to think about the different uh, intricacies of the AF or the NEG position uh, when we're debating. The next is for round division. While you are debating, you have an idea of what you want the round to look like. You have an idea of what your strongest arguments are, what their strongest arguments are, and how those interact with each other, and what you need to do to win those specific arguments or what would make their argument less persuasive. Next is success. So there are different levels uh, that we measure success in debate, whether that means we have answers to an argument now, that's success, whether that means we can beat a team uh, now with the arguments that we have in our arsenal, that is success, whether that means we are advancing in a tournament um, and just to be better prepared, that is also success. Uh, next is how do we strategize around pre-round prep? So before the round, uh, what do you do? How does, what does that strategy look like? So you will have a list of core arguments that you are exposed to. So we have like topic generics that we call those. And those are arguments that can be applied to almost any of the bigger apps on the topic. And uh, next is what happens if we hit something or run against something that we don't know. So you will have a toolkit or arsenal of arguments against smaller apps that maybe don't fit under the whole scope, uh, scope of the resolution, or what is your best argument? Things that you love learning about, you love talking about, things that come naturally to you that you've invested a lot of time in camp into to research that can be applicable to any argument. Uh, that was what your pre-round prep would look like. And then, yeah. Next is what does it mean to have round vision? So I like to use round vision uh, with two terms, predictability and anticipation. 
So what does it mean to be predictable? It is the fact of always behaving or occurring in a way that is expected. So when you read an argument, you already know what someone is going to say to you based off of their history of answering the argument before or common answers to that argument. And anticipation, which is a prior action that takes into account or forestalls a later action. So when you anticipate an argument, you're already setting them up for like the okie doke at the end. So round vision is knowing all of the parts of the AF or NEG or arguments in general and knowing how those parts move in the debate. So depending on whatever predictable or unpredictable answer that your opponents give you, you are anticipating the future of that debate to know what that debate should look like at the end when it comes to the rebuttals. So when we are talking about our strategies for success, one of the main things is trusting your strategy and overcoming doubt during the round. So because this is a partnered event, a lot of times you'll be in communication with your partner and you'll be like, okay, they did what they said they did. Is this time? Like, do we kick out of this? Is this what we want to go for? Or you're in prep time and you're debating with your partner and you're like, okay, what now? What do we do? What do we go for? What, what do we think gives us the best chance at winning when you've probably already decided what you wanted the debate to look like before round and now you're second guessing yourself. So being confident in the strategy that you have laid out or being confident to divvy away from the strategy that you've laid out. Sometimes our strategies don't work out the way that we think they do and being confident enough and being like, okay, this didn't happen the way that I thought it would happen. So we're gonna go for the best chance that we have at winning. Next is when you start being successful at tournaments and you get into out rounds. So most of your tournaments, your prelim debates will be preset, which means that you'll be assigned a side for AF or for NEG. Now, when you get into out rounds, some of the times those debates are flipping for sides. When you flip a coin and you can choose the side that you want to be on. So how do we confidently make a decision based off of the information that we are given to be successful during those out rounds? And so that means knowing, hey, my opponent is going to be AF and read this. Do we feel confident in being neg in that debate? Or, hey, we want to be AF because we are confident. It doesn't matter what they say against us. We will be ready. And so being able to strategize a way around that uh, to further yourself in the tournament is particularly important. So next is what does it mean to win? So first, we have a burden of proof. Um, it's a general concept that when you have to make a claim that you back it up and there are different burdens when you are AF or NEG. So what is the bright line for how much proof that we need? For the AF, we particularly talked about that, I think in Darcel's lecture when he gave you the stock issues. So in order to affirm the resolution, the AF team has to present a plan or an idea that differs from the status quo and explain how the proposal to how to propose to do what the resolution calls for. Next, the next burden is of just refutation, is just to negate the affirmative. The neg will present uh, reasons why the AF plans or ideas will not work and the disadvantages to that proposal. And that doesn't just mean reading a DA against whatever the AF says, but the consequences of the AF, the bad consequences of the AF. Those are all disadvantages, whether we label them as those or not. Uh, so the specific burden of proofs for the AF is significance, harms, inherency, topicality, and solvency. 
And if the case has all five of those stock issues, it is considered a prima facie case, which is Latin for on face or at glance. And this means that all the elements are present at first look and that the affirmative has met the burden in the debate round. So example, if after the 1AC, nothing is read against you, you would vote AF because you, you have met all of those burdens. There has been nothing presented to say that what you have done uh, causes a bad consequence. So that is almost called like a presumption. We are going to presume that the 1AC is correct. Next, uh, when we look at arguments, we want to look at all of the arguments in the debate and a version of offense versus defense. So what this means is that offensive arguments are the ones that give the judge a reason to vote for you. And defensive arguments are ones that give the judge a reason not to vote for the opponent. So example, if you are advocating for yourself in an argument of who is the better friend, let's say you and your peers are in a dilemma. So arguments of for you, offensive arguments, you would say, hello, I am caring. I share my resources. I'm always available to talk. Those are, I'm not judgmental. Those are all characteristics of why you yourself are a good friend. Defensive arguments would be, oh, Sarah's mean. Oh, Sarah doesn't text back. Sarah doesn't do anything. Those aren't reasons why you necessarily are a good friend. It's just a reason why someone else is a bad friend. So when we are in a debate, we want to be able to tell what arguments are for us and then what arguments that just aren't going to let us lose. And those are two different things. Sorry, I was trying to get the Zoom bar to come back up so I could unmute. Um, before we kind of transition into thinking specifically about different speeches and different arguments within the speeches, does anyone have any questions or concerns about the kind of general idea of things about um, having round vision, offense, defense, being confident, um, and kind of adaptable in your strategies? Um, someone let me know if there's a hand. I can't see. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, so no worries. So when you're negative, you have a lot of tools in your arsenal and I've gone too far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you have a lot of tools in your, in your arsenal. So, um, the first thing that any negative team will do in, in any particular debate is to start building their one and C, right? Because it's the first speech that you have. Um, and generally, you want to actually start building your one and Cs far before the debate begins, um, including in all the way up to camp, um, pre round prep for the tournaments when you're, you know, in debate class at school. Um, and you're negative, you're two on, you should always be thinking about what are my potential options to put in the one NC. Now, I know that I said that you start with the one NC, but as Jada was talking about with round vision, the goal when you're building a one NC is to have kind of a vision or an idea of what you want the TNR to be, right? We're not simply putting random arguments um, in our speeches, but rather we have goals with each argument that we put in. Now, that doesn't mean that each argument is going to appear in the TNR, right? but that each argument has a purpose and a reason for being in the one NC. We call this, uh, this concept establishing multiple routes to victory. Um, so in the one NC, you wanna have at least three or four, like a, a bunch of different routes to victory. And a route to victory is just a self-contained strategy that you could see, you could envision being the whole to an R, right? So one route to victory might be a counter plan with a disad as a net benefit to it. So you would put those two things in the one NC, right? Your counter plan shell and your disad shell. 
another route to victory might be that you've decided to impact turn one of the affirmative advantages on the case page, right? You got some offense on the case. That might be a second route to victory. You might think that the affirmative is uh, not topical in some way and that itself is contained in one argument. You could give a whole two hour just about topicality, right? Or um, potentially the critique. So there are a lot of different ways that you can establish these multiple routes for victory, both in terms of it could be a dissent and a counter plan, it could be topicality, it could be the critique, it could be a dissent in the status quo. But also within that, you can establish multiple route, routes for victory. You could read two or three different disadvantages, and then you get to choose um, at the end of the debate which disadvantage you want to go for. So you always want to begin the one and see. You want to try and have a variety of options out on the table. Um, so that way you can see how the affirmative responds. You know, um, if you're attacking them from multiple angles, then that means that some of their responses are going to be really strong, really prepared, really thought out. But sometimes there are arguments that you make that they might not have as strong of an answer to, whether it's because of the truth of how the world works, or maybe they didn't predict that argument as well as some of their other arguments. So as a result, by having multiple routes to victory in the one NC, you can see how the affirmative reacts and choose uh, which which routes are easier or uh, you know more persuasive for you to win later in the debate. Um, sometimes in the one and see we get so focused on developing our own offense, on you know making sure that we get out all of our off case positions and thinking about um, you know what we're going to say that we forget uh, that you know the AF has just spent eight minutes reading offense for themselves as well. So in the one and see, especially, you can't forget to answer the case, right? You need to read defense on the case to deny the, you know, that they solve it, that there's a huge impact to the case, that it's an important question to be considered. Um, and if you have offense as well, that the, case, the plan actually makes the case impacts worse, or that, you know, the case impacts are not so bad, they're actually good things. And that's super helpful because if you forget about answering the case, you know, then the affirmative just has all of this offense that they're in for eight minutes that they can start leveraging against your different positions in the 2AC and you're already behind from the get-go um, starting in the 1NC. So after the 1NC, remember the next negative speech is, is the block, right? It's the combination of the 2NC and the 1NR. And the block is considered the same speech, there are uh, slight differences between the 2NC and the 1NR, but generally they don't repeat each other. The 1NR will talk about issues that the 2NR doesn't, uh, or that the 2NC doesn't talk about. So the 1NR might talk about the disad or topicality while the 2NC is talking about the case and the counter plan, right? So they talk about different things. Because of that, um, there's a it's a really long speech, right? It's both a constructive and a rebuttal. So all together, it's like 12 minutes of speaking. And this slide is titled Condensing the Block. You would think, given the, that the block is larger than the 1NC, right, that we would try and expand and make even more arguments in the block. But rea the reality is, is that when we're negative, we really only have three speeches, right? We have the 1NC, the block, and then the 2NR, which is our kind of final push, our final summary of the debate. So we have to start making choices, which is a core idea that I'm going to come back to when we're affirmative as well. But we have to make choices in the debate. And specifically, we have to start making those choices in the block when we're negative. After we've put every like all of our possible routes to victory out in the 1NC, then we start saying, OK, what did the 2AC do? Which are, you know, did they do what we thought they were going to do? Did they have some tricks up their sleeve that we weren't predicting? What arguments are we going to continue to carry through and extend into the block and which arguments are we going to kick out of, right? Or we're going to stop extending, stop advocating for in, a, a ver in various ways. So you always wanna try and condense down in the block. So remember we had three or four routes to victory in the one NC, right? Now in the block, we're gonna, we're gonna narrow it down. We're gonna choose two, maybe three if we're you know, really, um, really quick or if we you know, think that we can get through some of them pretty quickly. Um, but generally, you want to try and narrow it down. So you have like two or three options for the two or not, right? So you don't want to play, you don't want to tip your hand, right? And be like, okay, so we're the only offense we're extending in the block is this disad. Um, you know, then the one in is like, oh, well, we know that they have to go for this disad, this one disad. Uh, so we can spend a lot of time, you know, building up our answers there. 
Whereas if you have two or three different routes, you know, you extend a disad, a counter plan, you answer the case and you extend topicality, right? Well, another one error is like, well, now we've got to answer the counter plan. We got to extend our case. We got to answer the disad. We got to answer topicality. And if they fail to do any of those things, then you know which route to victory is easiest, is the passive path of least resistance for the two or not. So you still have to maintain multiple strategies, at least two, right? But it needs to be less than there were in the one NC. Now, structurally, when you're negative, the, really the only structural advantage that you have um, is that you get the block versus the one AR, right? The block is 13 minutes of speaking, right? Eight plus five, um, whereas the one AR is only five minutes and the one AR is supposed to respond to the whole block. And we'll get to like what to do in the one AR in a little bit later, but when you're the, when you're the block, you have to take advantage of that structural inequity, right? Because the app has a couple other structural inequities that advantage them. They get to speak first, which means they choose the topic of the debate. Um, I mean, obviously the resolution kind of sets the bounds of the topic that it's about water protection, but the app gets to choose if we're talking about, you know, water rights, or if we're talking about fracking, or if we're talking about something else. Um, so the app gets to choose the topic of the debate, and because they speak last, that's also a massive advantage because their words are going to be the most um, clear, right, and the, the most closest to the judge when they're making the decision, right, because they heard from them last. So in order to kind of counter those benefits that the affirmative has simply because of the way that debate is designed, the block is a really useful time to try and make it so that the 1AR can't possibly respond effectively to every single negative position that you extend in the block. If, however, you don't make any choices and you just extend every single argument that was in the 1NC, then you're not going to have time to put pressure on the 1AR because you're not going to be able to develop any of those arguments further. You're not going to be able to make additional arguments, new arguments, um, new versions of your arguments and new extensions to your arguments that the 1AR has to respond to. You'll simply have time to repeat basically what was in the 1NC and, R, or 1NC and maybe add a few things. That doesn't put any pressure on the 1AR because the 1AR is like, oh, sweet. Now I just have to extend what was in the 2AC and I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to you know, try and make any choices, make any moves because you haven't made any choices. And it makes it, it's always going to benefit the affirmative, right? If, if no one is making any choices, the affirmative gets to speak last. So they'll probably win. So you have to start making those choices in the block. You know, Don't narrow down too much, but don't try and go for everything that was in the 1NC. One uh, one you simply won't have time to do so. Okay, so as we kind of start going into some of the specific um, types of arguments, um, we have a, we're not gonna go through and like explain every part of every argument. We don't have time to do that, but we're gonna go through and give you some helpful ticks and tips and tricks for each type of argument that you might extend as the negative. So the first being topicality. So first, when you're going for topicality, um, this means that you're making a decision that says they have done something outside of the resolution and that is bad and unfair for the debate and this debate should not have happened. So in the instance where you do that, this means topicality me needs to be your entire to and R. Like do not pair topicality with something else. This means that topic, if this is like, if you're putting all your eggs in this basket, this needs to be the one that you go for. So making sure that you have all of those components um, that make sense when going for topicality, which means a definition. This doesn't necessarily have to be one word. It can be multiple words that they have violated from the definition. Uh, and it just means that you have decided to define the topic as X, Y, and Z. And you think that that definition is best for debate because it's probably in the context of water protection policy, or it's been defined by like the EPA who regulates water protection policy, or there is an assumption that we've all make based off of the topic paper that this is going to be what the season is about. Um, you're choosing to define the resolution in that way you need to make sure that you have a clear violation. Where did they break the rule? Like what part of the AF 
broke the rule and made the un- the game unfair for you. Standards are why is that bad? Make sure that you're answering their counter standards because they will give reasons why they think that their definition is good for debate. So you have to make sure that you're answering your standards and answering theirs. And then your voters is what does this mean for us in the game? So I think a layer of all arguments and not just going not just going for topicality that's missing is, okay, we've won this argument, now what? So what does that mean for you in the context of debate? What do you want the judge to get from knowing that you have won this argument? So these arguments, your voters would be like, they have made it unfair for us. What does fairness mean in the context of debate? That means you never had a chance after the 1AC. That's probably a bad thing. If they, you're saying you're going for education, you are be like, this round was anti-educational and future rounds would be anti-educational if they continued to read this argument. That's probably a bad precedent to set for an activity that's built off of education and research. So those are the things that we should be looking at when we are building a two and R around topicality. Zoom fun. All right. One thing as well, um, if you want to kind of get into some of the nuts and bolts of some of these positions, um, if you go to the resources page on the website, there's a link to the YouTube channel that has um, more in-depth kind of explanations of each of these positions and their mechanics. But we're, um, yeah, we don't have time to do all of that, but there's resources and lectures. They're short, like 20 minutes that you can go watch on YouTube later if you want. Um, if you're like, I don't know anything about topicality, though. Um, kind of go and explain it. So one of the other possible options that you can go for is a disad and the status quo. Um, Status quo being just what's happening now. It's another fancy Latin word. Um, We use a couple of fancy Latin words in debate every now and again, because we like to think that we're fancy. Um, So sometimes, you know, you don't, your counter plan doesn't work out. Maybe they had, you know, some good offense or some good solvency deficits that you didn't think about before you read the counter plan. And you have no option but to go for the status quo and just say we shouldn't change anything, right? And that's um, you know because of whatever dissed that you have, especially in a scenario where the two and R is only going for a dissed and not for a counter plan. You absolutely have to answer the case, right? And you can answer the case either with offense or defense or a combination of the two. But if you don't answer the case, it's going to be very very difficult for you to win just a dissed and the status quo, right? Um, if you, I'm sure all of you are aware, but the, the status quo is not really doing so hot right now, um, you know, with the pandemic. And um, I'm sure if you've been watching the news, uh, geopolitics is, um, it, let's just say it's not, it's not as stable as it was five, 10 years ago, even. I mean, um, uh, we've had a Saigon moment before, we'll have another Saigon moment again. I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to make any particular commentary on what's happening in Afghanistan. I'm just saying that, you know, the the world is a little less stable than it used to be. And as a result, it is structurally harder to defend the status quo, right? Um, because we can see, you know, the effects of warming happening, a bunch of other stuff. So as a result, you absolutely have to answer, uh, answer the case uh, when you're going for the status quo, right? So you need defense against the act, the problems that they're ident- that they identified, they don't solve those problems. The problems aren't nearly as important as whatever the disad is talking about, um, you know, or offense. They, they, the AF actually makes, not only does it cause this disad, but it makes the problems that it's trying to solve worse, or that the problems that the AF identifies actually are not problems, but they're good things that, that uh, we should maintain. So, when you're going for the dissed, you have to answer the case or the case is just going to outweigh, right? Because remember, the 1A, the 1AC spent eight minutes reading high quality evidence saying that the status quo was bad, that a bunch of bad things are going to happen in the status quo unless we do the plan. So you have to answer to the case. Additionally, when you're going for the dissed, impact calculus, which we'll talk about more in a minute, but it's the compare, that exact comparison between which issue is more important, 
that is the most important thing to do when going for just the disad, that you absolutely need to do impact calculus to describe why the impact to the disadvantage is way more important, way more serious than the impact to the affirmative, right? And there are a couple parts of impact calculus um, that we'll get into, um, but that you should be thinking about, right? Traditionally, impact calculus has focused on three concepts, uh, time frame, which is just which one happens first, pretty simple, uh, probability, right? Which one is more likely to happen and magnitude, which one is bigger. So you wanna, using some of those criteria, compare the, the disad to the status quo. Maybe the environment impacts that the affirmative is talking about, like those take a really long time and it might not happen for 20 or 30 years, but if the economy collapsed in the short term, right, then uh, that's a much quicker impact. It could cause really bad things like war or uh, you know other bad things as a result. So you might focus on, in that case, on time frame, right? Or you might be focusing on magnitude saying like, you know, fracking, yeah, you know, might have some problems with, you know, groundwater contamination, but, you know, that kind of pales in comparison to the possibility of a nuclear war, right? Um, the other kind of component of impact calculus, besides just like a direct comparison using time frame, magnitude, or probability, is a turns the case argument. And what I mean, um, what I mean when I say turns the case, remember that the word turns should signal to you that this is an offensive argument, right? And when the disad turns the case, it means that the disad flips what's going on. So if you're reading the economy disad versus the environment advantage, right? You might want to make an argument that says that if our economy collapsed, there goes all of our, our environmental regulations. Like pe people aren't going to enforce them. There's going to be a bunch, a bunch more pollution in a world where the economy collapses. And if we get into this massive war, uh, that's going to have some environmental impacts as well um, in terms of, you know, war is generally not good for the environment. Um, there's like bombs and stuff. So, you know, you might have arguments as to why if the disad were to happen, it kind of makes the AF irrelevant because those impacts become inevitable, right? If, or, you know, for some other reason, it might affect the internal link level. So, you know, if the economy goes down, we don't have money to spend in order to like um, remediate carbon out of the atmosphere or, you know, clean up some of the areas where fracking has already happened, you know, stuff like that. Um, so you want to utilize those disad turns the case arguments as a way to combine with your case defense or case offense and minimize the, um, you know, the, the impact to the affirmative. And doing so will make it so that the disad becomes more and more important, right? When you're only going for the disad, you have to absolutely minimize the importance of the affirmative or you're not gonna be able to win the impact calculus debate, right? Um, because they have a lot of time to read a lot of high quality evidence to support whatever their, um, advantages. Um, okay, so so let's say that things kind of worked out differently and you've decided instead of going for the status quo in the disad, you're going to go for a counterpoint. Um, importantly, the first thing that you, you should think about is that the counterplan fundamentally is a defensive argument. So when we were talking earlier, defense stops the other team from scoring points and offense is a way for you to score points. The counterplan alone doesn't score you any points, right? Just proving that there's something else that could be done that solves the affirmative doesn't disprove that the plan would solve the affirmative or that the plan is a good idea, right? So you can't just go for a counter plan in the 2 and R, you have to go for a counter plan and a disadvantage because the disadvantage is what we call a net benefit, right? which proves Net benefit is from um, this concept called cost benefit analysis that is really popular in political science um, and other sciences as well. Um, but basically it's this idea that when you have two options, right? You add up all the costs, you add up all the benefits and you see which one has more benefits versus costs. So when we're comparing a counter plan to a disad, we need to have reasons why the counter plan, when you add up all the costs and the benefits or the advantages and the disadvantages, why the counter plan is a better idea. So the disadvantage is something that links to the plan, but not to the counter plan. That whatever the counter plan does that's different from the plan, that's the thing that you're gonna read the disadvantage about, right? So in the packet, for example, we have a disad that's about economic um, business confidence, right? And it's about fracking regulations. And the counter plan, which, you know, 
distributes vaccines and does some environmental remediation for wetlands, right? Those aren't the same type of environmental regulations as the plan. So your dissat is gonna focus on the plan's environmental regulation, right? It's something that the plan does that the counter plan doesn't do. So it's a net benefit to the counter plan because the counter plan doesn't cause, you know, all these businesses to be like, what's happening? Whereas the plan does. And even if you were to do both the counter plan and the plan, business would still be like, we don't like these fracking regulations. You know, it's, it's gonna really harm the economy. So you can utilize the net benefit to answer the permutation, the idea that we could just do both the counter plan and the plan at the same time. Well, in 90% of the debates, the reason why we shouldn't do that, why it's preferable to just do the counter plan alone is because of the net benefit, which is your disad. Even though we have a counter plan that we think solves the case, we still have to do impact calculus, right? We still wanna describe why the disad is more important or why it outweighs the case, right? And we do that using magnitude, probability, or time frame and why it turns the affirmative, right? So that's that turns case argument I was talking for. Now, impact calc is not as important as when you're working for the status quo, but it's it's still uh, a way for you to kind of minimize the importance of the affirmative because it might be possible that the affirmative is going to win a solvency deficit that the counter plan doesn't solve as much um, or some other arguments that means that you need, uh, you still need to answer the affirmative even if you're going for the counter plan in some way. Um, you don't have to spend as much time like denying every claim the affirmative has made, right? But you need to have impact calculus, you need to have turns case arguments, um, and you need to be on top of the solvency debate on the counter plan in order to win in the 2 and art, right? You have to win that the counter plan solves at least a large part of the case in order for it to be useful. Okay, um, so then we're gonna talk for a moment about going for the critique. Something to keep in mind is that if you haven't heard about the critique yet or about the K, um, we, you know, uh, we, spell it with, we spell it with a K instead of a C for history reasons about Germany, but don't worry about it. Um, but if, if you're not familiar with the critique, don't worry. Um, there's a lecture on it on YouTube, but also um, this will be recorded and you can always come back. So a lot of times we think that if we're going for the critique, um, that we don't have to answer the affirmative, right? We just have to talk about whatever the critique is saying, but that is not true. The critique must always interact with and disprove the case in some way. Um, oh, I'm gonna answer this question in the chat really quick. So excellent question, Lily. Um, Lily asks, if we as the negative side prove that we should do both the plan and the counter plan, do we win? Um, it's, a good, it's a good idea, but that's actually an argument that the other team makes, that the affirmative, uh, the affirmative team makes. The affirmative is gonna argue that, you know, if, if the counter plan is a good idea, it, it's not mutually exclusive or it's not competitive with the plan that we should do both of those things together, right? Because it's still doing the plan. So that still proves that the plan is a good idea. So, so that's an argument that is featured prominently in debate and it's called a permutation, but it's an argument that if that the affirmative team makes and if the affirmative wins that argument, then they win the debate, right? So the negative team has to prove that we should only do the counter plan, that we shouldn't do the plan and that we should not do a combination of the plan and the counter plan, that we should only do the counter plan. But excellent question. Um, I hope that clears up. This also applies to the critique as well, right? Because the critique has an alternative, which is like a counter plan that says that we should kind of change how we think about things. We should change how we research things. We should change how we you know, do things in the world more generally, our economic or political structure, you know, whatever it is, right? So the negative has to prove that the counter plan or the critique alternative oh, no, I've there, um, alone is better than the plan or the combination of the plan and the counter plan. Um, yeah, great question. Um, so the critique must interact with and disprove the case, right? And that, that can happen in a lot of different ways, right? You can disprove the truth value of their arguments, maybe um, all of their kind of extinction level scenarios. You can disprove the truth value and be like, these are all exaggerated threats that are you know, designed to accomplish certain political goals. Um, or you can um, make arguments that disprove the usefulness of thinking in the way that the case thinks, right? That, that the critique must, uh, the critique can say, you know, this kind of obsession with policy and with what the government does, that that's not useful, it doesn't help, it's bad in some ways, right? But you need to, at some level, 
interact with what the case is doing. If you just talk about your critique and you don't talk about the case, unless the other team forgets that they have an F, you're going to be in a bad position, right? Because they're almost certainly going to have more specific evidence than you do. Um, so they'll, you know, so they'll be able to say, hey, you know, all this critique stuff is interesting, but like we stop environmental destruction, that seems important. Um, and judges be like, yeah, that does seem important. Um, I'll vote for the permutation, right? We can learn about this other critique stuff and also, you know, end fracking or whatever the plan is. So another thing with the critique is that you need to focus on your offense, right? So you need to focus on what the what did the AF do that was bad, right? Oftentimes in critique in critique debates, especially in high school, we tend rather to focus on what could the AF have done that's better. Right. So we'll be like, oh, the AF didn't solve for this group of people or the AF didn't think about this problem. Right. That's those aren't offensive arguments. Those are just defensive arguments. Right. They're like the AF could have been better. Right. But not no AF is ever going to be perfect. So proving that it could have been better is not enough to win the debate. You have to prove that the AF was bad. Right. That it did something that was problematic. Right. That it made an assumption or that it participated in a structure of power um, or that the AF's language or discourse that they were using, the words that they were using were, you know, have certain connotations that are bad, right? But you can't simply be like the AF didn't solve or didn't think about, you know, um, capitalism, so therefore vote for the critique. That's not, a, that's not offense, right? You're like This is the way in which the AF was capitalist, which is different than saying the AF didn't address or didn't think about capitalism, right? So you have to, when you're going for the critique, focus on what specifically you're, you think the affirmative did that you have problems with, right? And then finally, we oftentimes forget about the alternative, but a good alternative and a good alternative debating is, is massively underutilized and can really get you really far ahead in the debate. If you can succinctly describe, you know, what is the problem and how we should shift, you know, either our thinking or our actions in order to deal with that problem, you know, then that will allow you to generate, um, you know, a lot of pressure on the affirmative because then it's not just like um, you're pointing out a problem that already exists, right? But that you have a solution to that problem as well. And if the affirmative gets in the way of that solution, right, then that's a problem for, uh, you know, for them because it means that they link to your, to your offense. A chat. Um, yeah, so the alternative is sort of a redefining of the rules. That's that's definitely one way to think of it, but um, it's not just the, the rules of the debate, right? But also sometimes alternatives will have much broader scopes. Uh, so they'll think about like the rules of society, maybe even um, to some, some alternatives. Some alternatives will be very specific about like the way that we talk about things. Some alternatives might be the way that we do research, right? So there, the critique addresses a lot of different um, possible avenues and the alternative kind of lines up with whatever the critique is talking about. But um, that's a good way to think about the alternative is that it's kind of like a redefinition of both, you know, specific rules that we have in debate or in society, but also kind of a re-envisioning of those kinds of rules and norms, how we interact with each other, how um, the economy works, whatever the critique is about. It could be about a lot of different stuff. But um, but yeah, think about it, thinking about it as kind of redefining, you know, some of these rules or, or what oftentimes we'll refer to as assumptions, right? These kind of unwritten things that like, when you make an argument about the economy, right? There's kind of an assumption, right? That like economic growth is good, for example, right? Which is, um, you know, particular to certain forms of st economic structures. So the alternative is definitely I think that's a good way to think about it is redefining those rules or those assumptions or those norms that exist that you've identified as the affirmative both participating in and that those rules and norms are bad for you know some reason. Okay, cool. Um, all right, um, sometimes um, debates become about theory. Um, and when we talk about theory, right, we're not talking about like academic theory about, you know, stuff about how states interact with each other, right? but we're talking about specifically debate theory, which is theory about what should happen in debates, right? So ultimately, there's, you know, there's really only one rule in debate, right, is that at the end of the debate, there's one like hard 
hard and fast rule is that at the end of the debate, the judge makes a decision for one team or the other, and that there's a time limit on how that happens. Literally every other thing in debate at some point, including things like speech times, style, argument, uh, argument content have been challenged, um, have been debated about, um, and, and those rules have all been you know, broken and teams have won breaking some of those rules, right? So they're not really like rules in like the sense of like in chess, right? You can't just like move pieces randomly, right? So instead of having those types of like stringent rules where there's like a rule book with like a thousand different rules for debate, right? We have what's called theory debates where unlike any other competitive activity in debate, we get to debate about the rules for the debate, which, you know, it's like that, it's like that, um, the ice tea meme, you know, we heard you like debating. So we put debates about debate in your debate. Um, I don't know if that's too old of a meme reference for you all, but, uh, oh gosh. Anyways, um, in a theory debate, so that seems complicated because it's a debate about debate, but really at its core, it's just like any other debate, right? It's structured through offense and defense. Are you scoring points for yourself? Or are you preventing, uh, you know, the other team from scoring points. It's like any other debate that you're having, it's just about the rules. So the content's a little different, but in form, you know, it's the same. We're still trying to have offense and defense. Um, generally in a theory debate, you're not going to be reading like evidence from experts or anything, right? Because we're talking about that activity that we're doing. So you want to go a little bit slower to make sure the judge can flow everything that you're saying. Um, and then you need to think if you want the theory argument to be a reason to reject the team, or a reason uh, just to reject the argument, right? Um, so when you're negative, mostly the theory arguments that you're gonna be talking about are things like framework or um, topicality, which um, we, we just talked about a little bit earlier, right? Um, and these are kind of theoretical arguments about what the scope, what the affirmative should be allowed to do. Should they you know, be allowed to go beyond the scope of the resolution? Should they be confined to particular definitions of the resolution, et cetera? Um, so you need to be clear if you want the theory argument that you're making to be a reason to reject the team or just the argument. And when you're negative, a lot of times your theory is a reason to reject uh, the team, right? Because you're saying that this debate shouldn't have happened. We weren't prepared for it, um, et cetera. When you're affirmative and you're going for theory arguments, it's a little different because you're criticizing the negatives argumentative practices. So most of the time when you're affirmative and you go for a theory argument, it's just a reason to reject the argument. You know, the counter plan was abusive. It used fiat in a way that it wasn't supposed to, fiat being the idea that we just get to wit, we just get to debate about the consequences of a point happening and not whether or not it would actually happen. Um, you know, some of those practices are most of the time just reasons to reject the argument, right? That like this particular counter plan is not legitimate theoretically, so we shouldn't have to debate it. Um, and very rarely will theory be a reason to reject the team, right? Unless you're criticizing them for like their overall practices. Like maybe you're going for a, a theory argument about conditionality and they've read four or five different conditional arguments. Well, it doesn't make sense just to reject the argument because all of their arguments are conditional. So it's a reason to reject the team. Now that might seem kind of confusing for you, um, but theory is one of those things where you need to know a little bit about debate before you can really get into it. Um, so don't worry if that kind of, went over your head, theory is um, kind of one of the, the last things that you, sh you, you will be concerned with in a debate. Um, for now, you know, focus on the kind of substance, the disad, the counter plan, the critique or topicality is kind of where you'll spend most of your theory time, um, you know, at this point in debate. Uh, next is going for presumption in the 2 and R. So what do we do when the affirmative has not met their burden or those five stock issues that we have labeled? One of those things are missing. So that would look like, can you go on the next slide? So... Uh, that would look like if you are to talk about the significance of the affirmative, there are two different types of significances. One is quantitative significance, which is in numbers and stats and percentiles. And then there are qualitative significance, which are like big impacts, like threats to 
society, the world, environments, and things like that. So those are two different avenues that you can go about to say that the affirmative is not significant enough. Next are the harms that they have outlined. These are the bad things that are happening in the status quo that the AF plans to solve. If they just propose a plan, but nothing, it doesn't solve anything, or there is no positive effect of doing the plan, then why do the plan? Uh, the next portion is inherency. So this inherency is where you will prove why the harms are currently not being solved, which is the reason that they need the plan or the proposal that they are going about. So there are three different types of inherency. So first is structural inherency. That means that there is a policy or law that is currently in place that prevents the status quo from solving the problems themselves. So that means that if there is a policy or law that is bad, that is causing these problems, that means the AF has to repeal, reverse, work around, do something to avoid that problem. So if the AF doesn't call for a repeal or a reversal, then it's probably likely that that problem will persist despite the plan happening. The next type of inherency that we have is attitudinal inherency, which just means that there is an attitude or an opinion by a person or persons that is preventing our problems from being solved example we could talk about like the plan will never pass joe biden would hate it or like in previous administrations the plan will never pass trump would never go for something like that or we can say the plan will never pass there are these congress persons list congress persons that will vote the opposite way but in policy debate, we have this cool thing called fiat, which just means that we can bypass sort of these opinions. And it is an assumption that once the judge signs their ballot, that the plan is into action, despite, I want to say, personal opinions of said persons that are actually doing the lawmaking. The next type of inherency that we have is existential inherency, which just means that there is no particular reason our problems aren't being solved. They just aren't being solved. And then you have topicality. We told you what that would look like. So if they're not topical, that is also not meeting uh, their burden of proof. Uh, within the stock issues. And then solvency. Does the proposal solve the harms that they have outlined? So they can outline these particular issues that they plan to solve, but if they don't actually solve them, or let's say their characterization of the world is not in the direction that they say it is, like let's say our economy is not declining and our economy is actually doing pretty good, so there's nothing to solve. Or let's say environmental and biodiversity uh, collapse is not actually that bad because it's going to figure itself out in like two years because it always has. So if the affirmative has no significant effect on solving these problems and the problems are going to work themselves out with or without the plan, then they have also not met their burden of proof of being F. All right, before, uh, before we move on to the affirmative, I'm just gonna add a couple of things about um, presumption um, and about the stock issues. So a lot of times you'll see people combine some of these stock issues and the way that they label their one, and one ACs. So even if you don't see, you know, people say inherency, harm, significance, um, solvency, and people don't say topicality until the negative accuses them of being on topical. 
Um, it's just kind of presumed you're topical until the negative says you aren't. But oftentimes inherency, significance, and harms will be combined into one, um, one flow or kind of one concept in the 1AC, and they'll call it an advantage, right? So the way that the 1AC in the packet is set up is that the inherency, harms, and significance are all combined together into an advantage where you say, this is the bad thing. Here's why it's currently happening. We don't have fracking regulations. The bad thing is that fracking is bad for the environment. The significance is that it will you know, cause all these destructions, both numerically, here's some data about it, and then here are the like big societal impacts that, that we're going to talk about, right? So even if you don't see the words inherency or harms or significance, usually that's all um, in, in more recently, people have taken to kind of combining all of those into one term and calling it an advantage. And sometimes even solvency is um, put into the advantage so that it's kind of um, organized thematically rather than being organized in terms of these stock issues here. So if you don't see all of these terms, that doesn't mean that the affirmative doesn't have them, right? You just have to think, does, does the affirmative have an argument for why these problems exist? Do they have an argument for why these harms um, you know, are ongoing and happening in the status quo? Do they have an argument for why it's important to think about them? And do they have an argument for why the plan solves those, those uh, problems, right? Is, is kind of the basis of what you might see in a 1AC. Um, additionally, more off, most often when you go for presumption um, in the 2NR, you'll be going for an ar un presumption argument about solvency because um, it's most most affirmatives will like be very clear in the problems that they're outlining. Um, and the problem is more so that the solution that they proposed is um, you know not large enough to deal with the problems that that they're talking about. Um, you know, they're, you know, the AF might be talking about like the whole of global warming and, and the solution of banning fracking might not have the scope in order to solve that problem. So the most common form of presumption argument in debate is a solvency argument that the affirmative hasn't, um, you know, they don't solve their advantages or they haven't proposed a large enough change from the status quo to, to be kind of significant or to have solvency. Okay. Um, so now we're going to go on to being AF, but before we do that, um, we're going to, before we do that, if there's any questions or if you need us to go back over anything, um, put it in the chat right now. I can't see the, the little Zoom boxes, so um, I won't be able to see like emojis or anything. Um, so if you have any questions, put it in the chat or if you want us to go over anything again. All right, cool. Um, I'm gonna move on to being affirmative, but if you think of a question, I, you can always just, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't know what it was that you went over before um, the, uh, the alternative stuff, before the stuff you just went over, did you go over anything before that? Um, before what? Before um, the, um, uh, it, I don't know what it was, but um, before what you just talk about, did you go anything before that? Um, so we have covered quite a few things, um, but this both the slides and the presentation will be uploaded. So if you you know missed a large chunk or anything, um, though you'll be able to either go back to the slides or also go back and listen to the presentation. But I'm not sure um, kind of exactly where um, you're asking about. Okay. And that, that will be on the website. Yep. Yep. It will be posted on the website. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so now we're going to move from being negative to being affirmative and how to think strategically on the AF. Um, so first is the construction of the affirmative, right? So similar to when you're negative and you want to think about the two and R when you're writing the one AC, the one NC. When you're affirmative, you want to be thinking about what potential two ARs you want to give when you're writing the one AC, right? Um, so you want to be able to set up similarly on the affirmative multiple routes to victory, which means that your affirmative should make more than one argument, right? If the only argument your affirmative makes is that fracking is bad 
for the for because it causes you know groundwater contamination right and you don't talk about anything else right then that's when you that's not going to set you up for an easy debate right because the negative is like well the f only has this one thing we'll just bury this part of the debate and you know say a bunch of stuff about it um and you know put our best arguments there and then you're kind of out of luck right so you want to set up multiple routes to victory talk about a variety of the environmental impacts add in some of the stuff about the economy as well right to give you to set up options for the two ar now uh in the 1AC, um, when you're thinking about what the 2AR is going to be, right, you might think, okay, so we really want to give, we want it, we most want to give our 2AR for this fracking affirmative about the environment impacts. We think that's the strongest part of our affirmative, right? Then, then you want to make sure that that part of your affirmative is where you're reading your best evidence, right? The 1AC, you have as much time as you need before the tournament to get it together, um, and, and you know exactly what it's going to say. Right, so you want to be trying to read quality evidence in the one AC, like your best evidence. Read it in the one AC, so that way in the two AC you don't have to read more cards on on issues, but you can just cross apply one AC evidence, which is both easier and faster than trying to read whole new two AC cards. Right, there's if you get up in the two AC and you don't extend any one AC evidence and you just read a bunch of new cards, then basically the one AC has been wasted. You know. Um, and that's eight minutes of speak, speaking time that you're not going to get back. So you always want to remember the 1AC and utilize uh, your quality evidence in the 1AC um, in order to answer negative positions. Um, sometimes, you know, you have plans about your routes to victory. You really want to go for the environment uh, advantage, but the, you know, the negative team has spent, you know, a bunch of time on the environment advantage. They have a bunch of defense, but they didn't spend very much time on the economy advantage. So that's why you set up multiple routes to victory. So you can pivot and be like, okay, even though it's not our best argument, given what happened in this debate, it's much more, it's a much higher quality argument now because they've said much less to answer it than they did to answer the other advantage. So that's the important important part to have multiple routes to victory in the 1AC, just like in the 1NC. Um, okay, so remember earlier we were negative, we were talking about the block's goal is to kind of overwhelm the 1AR. So how do you deal with that? You know, when you're the one that's giving the 1AR, you have five minutes to answer 13 minutes uh, of argumentation. Now, I know that um, I got into debate because I'm not very good at math, but I do know that 13 is a much bigger number than five. Um, I, I managed to, to gather that one. Mathematically, the 1AR will not be able to cover or answer, when we say cover, we just mean respond to arguments. They can't cover or answer every argument that's in the block. Like it's just literally impossible um, because of time. So it's really, in the 1AR especially, I think in the 1AR is, this is true, the speech that this is most true for, you have to absolutely make choices, right? So that means, that you might kick an advantage, right? Let's say that in the 1AR, you know, the, the 2NC spent five minutes talking about the environment advantage and only one minute talking about the economy advantage. You might have to, even though you really like the environment advantage in the 1AR, make the decision, we don't have time to respond to every argument made here. So we're gonna kick this advantage so we can focus on, you know, the economy. And that's kind of a choice that we have to make. So in order to make these choices, right? The 1AR does, just doesn't, as soon as the block is over, get up and start randomly doing whatever they want, right? But you absolutely need to take prep time before the 1AR to have a conversation between the 2A and the 1A, because the 2A has to give the 2AR, right? And the, the final rebuttal is the 2NR and the 2AR are where you win or you lose a debate. So because the 2A has to give the 2AR, they can kind of see what's happening in the debate and they'd be like, okay, I need this environment advantage and we should extend the economy advantage and we're going to extend you know the link turn on the disadvantage that's kind of what we're going to do in this 1ar so it's you know less important for us to spend a lot of time answering the counter plan um or you know um we're going to kick this advantage or whatever but you have to talk with the 2a so the 2a can tell you this is what i want to do in the 2ar and then the 1a can be like okay i got you i'm going to do what i can in order to make it possible for you to give that 2ar um, excellent question about kicking an argument. When you kick an argument, do you have to announce that you're kicking it or do you just not address it anymore? So 
the answer is, is more complicated than what you were probably hoping for. Sometimes you just don't address it anymore and sometimes you have to kick it. Now, the way that you know um, whether or not you have to address it is if the affirmative team, it, so if you're negative, if the affirmative team has made offensive arguments against the position that you're trying to kick, then you have to uh, actually do some work to kick it. So let's say that you wanna kick a disadvantage, right? And the affirmative has a not unique argument, a link turn argument and a no impact argument in the 2AC, right? If you just say nothing about this again, then in the 1AR, the affirmative can get up and be like, you know, extend the not unique, extend the link turn, this disadvantage because the, the other team has conceded, the negative team has conceded that the plan actually helps this problem this disadvantage is now an advantage for the affirmative. So in that case, you need to kick out of that disadvantage. And the way that you would do that is by extending the impact defense argument, the argument that they made that said that they made, not the argument that you made, right? But the argument that the affirmative made that said that there's no impact to the disadvantage, that it's actually not a problem. So if you extend that argument, right, that it's not a problem, then it doesn't matter if the affirmative, you know, solves that issue or not, because you've, they made the argument and you conceded it, which means it's true that whatever the dissed was about, that that issue is not important. It's not an issue that we should care about, um, or the dissed isn't true in some way. Now, for topicality, for example, if you don't want to go for topicality anymore, the affirmative doesn't get to win the debate just by being topical, right? It's one of their burdens, as, as Jada was just talking about. They, they have to be topical. They can only lose the debate by being non-topical, but proving that they are topical doesn't prove that they win the debate. So when you're not going for topicality anymore, you know they, they can't turn that into an advantage for the affirmative of being topical. Like that's a burden that they have, not an advantage that they can claim. So you don't have, when you are done going for topicality, you don't have to talk about it anymore. Um, but basically that's just a long way of saying that if the affirmative can get an advantage or if the other team can get, the, can get an advantage out of you not talking about a position that you wanna kick, then you should spend some time to make sure and concede arguments that the other team made in order to make that position go away. Um, if there's no potential advantage, like let's say they only have defensive on it, that you know they said no link, no impact, not unique against your disad, then they don't have an offensive argument that they can extend in order to make that into an advantage, right? They don't have a link turn argument that said that the plan solves the problem or an impact turn argument that said the problem was actually a good thing. So it's much less important to like announce that you're kicking out and to do the work to extend a defensive argument because there's no offense for them to extend. But if they have a link turn or an impact turn, and this is true when you're affirmative too, if they have a link turn or an impact turn on your advantage, then you have to extend a piece of defense that the other team made, an argument that the other team made in order to get out of uh, having to go for that flow. Did that clear things up or just make them even more complicated for you all? <laughs> all right, I'll, I'm gonna go with more complicated, but <laughs> hopefully it was helpful. Um, cool, awesome. Um, perfect. So in the 1AR, you have to make these choices. You need to talk with the 2A before the 1AR uh, so that you can see what the 2AR wants to focus on. And you should have a goal in mind for each flow. In the 1AR especially, we oftentimes fall into the trap of just like looking at our notes, our flows, and being like, oh, I just got to respond to everything. You know, I'll just go down the piece of paper and respond to every argument that they made. But um, in reality, you don't have time to do that. Instead, you should have a goal in mind for each flow that you don't have to go and answer every single argument that was made, right? We should be like, okay, on this disad, we're gonna go for a link turn on the disad, right? So we know that we have to win the link turn. We know that we have to win our not unique argument in order to make the link turn offense. Um, but because we're going for a link turn, you know, we probably don't have to do as much of the impact debating because we're not saying that the impact to the disad isn't important right? We're saying that the plan solves that impact. It's actually an advantage for the affirmative. So in the 1AR, you don't need to go and answer every part of the disad, just extend the parts about the link turn, right? Even if in the 2AC, you said no impact and you had some arguments there, right? Um, because you've decided to extend the offense on the disad, right? You don't have to answer every single part in the 1AR, even if, even though in the 2AC, it's a really good idea to answer every part of the, uh, of the disad, right? So you want to have a goal in mind for each flow that you go go to. And the way that you get that goal 
is by talking to the 2A. The 2A says, this is what I want to say in the 2AR. So your goal is, how do I make sure that I get enough arguments out in the 1AR in order to make the 2A, that 2AR possible? And more specifically, um, how do I, you know, make sure that we're not um, conceding any super, super important arguments from the block? Arguments that if we don't answer them, they're going to, you know, we're just going to lose the debate. Um, and this is hard to do when you're first starting out um, because it's hard to figure out like which arguments are more dangerous than one another. So just focus on talking with the 2A and setting up what the 2A wants for the 2AR right now. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so topicality, answering topicality. So we talked a little bit about, um, you know, about how to go for topicality, right? But when you're answering topicality, right, you need to first don't forget about offense and impacts. Uh, you need to have reasons why your interpretation of what the affirmative should be allowed to do is is um, you know is good, is more beneficial than the negatives kind of more restricted understanding of whatever the topic is. Um, you know, and that might be for reasons of education. Um, you it might be for reasons of fairness. Um, it might be for more kind of critical reasons about, um, you know, inclusion and exclusion, um, depending on, you know, what your affirmative is about, right? But we oftentimes have this um, reaction where we think that T is just like a yes, no question of fact, like, is the affirmative topical or is it not topical, right? But T is a debatable position, right? Under some interpretations, some affirmatives are topical, but under different interpretations, those affirmatives might not be topical. So T isn't like a yes, no question, like we have a list of all the affirmatives that are topical, right? But it's debatable. What should the topic look like? Um, which means that you need offense when you're affirmative and not just when you're negative. Um, and you need to do impact calculus, even in T debates, right? More often than not, when you're affirmative, your offense on T is gonna be about education. And when you're negative, your offense on T is going to be about fairness. So you can do an impact calc debate where you debate what's more important for debate, fairness or education. Like, is it important that we have the exact fairest game or should we be looking to maximize the amount of education we have in each debate, right? And that's not universally true, but that's generally how T debates go down, is that the neg team says that the F team was unfair and the F team says it's okay that they were a little unfair. Um, because, you know, the education provided by the affirmative was, you know, super, super important. Um, but you need to do those debates, you know, what is more important, education or fairness? And it's not, not like a, there's not like a right answer, right? It's debatable. Sometimes education is more important, sometimes fairness is more important. So in T debates, you need to do impact calculus. Think about your offense. Why should we include the F, not just is the F topical? Right, but what is our vision for what debate should be? Because that's what topicality debates ultimately are about, right? So don't lose yourself um, and, and forget that you need offense and impacts even in a T debate. All right, answering the disadvantage. So the, mo the most common problem that debaters have when they try and answer the disadvantage is that they forget that they spent the whole 1AC reading an affirmative. Um, so you, you shouldn't forget about the affirmative and you should think about ways in which the affirmative interacts with the disadvantage, right? So in the packet, right, we have a disadvantage about the economy. Now the affirmative also has a potential advantage about the economy. So you might want to start in the 2AC thinking about how your F argument about the economy interacts with the NAG argument about economy and start doing those comparisons. Be like the affirmative actually solves the economy. It doesn't you know, even if there's some short term economic shocks or whatever, in the long term, the affirmative solves the economy, and that's more important, right? Additionally, you want to start impact calc in the 2AC. You know, these for you want to say, like, the environment impact is the economy impact. Um, envir the environment is constantly sacrificed in the name of the economy. You know, some of those impact calc type comparisons between the environment and the economy, you want to start that in the 2AC and start saying the case outweighs and turns the disad. So you can have the same, the same kind of turns arguments going the other way that, you know, um, if our environment collapses and that's obviously going to have some significant implications for our economy, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you wanna start that impact calc early in the 2AC um, so you can develop it later in the debate. 
And then finally, there's this concept in debate called uh, try or die framing, um, which is the idea that if the affirmative wins, that there's a risk of one of their impacts and that impact is like really big, you know, it might be like a, a, a large scale war or like global warming and it threatens kind of human survival, um, then, you know, regardless of any potential disadvantages, we, we should try and do the affirmative or else everyone's gonna die inevitably no matter what, right? So if they don't go for a counter plan, right, then you can utilize your 1AC to prove that the status quo is going to result in extinction at some point, right? So even if there are disadvantages, you should take, the judge should take the risk and do the affirmative because we know for a fact that if we do nothing, everyone's going to die. If we do something, everyone might die, but they might not, you know, and that's a, that's a gamble um, that the judge should, should vote for the affirmative for. Um, so this only works if, oh, sorry. This only works if they're not if they're going for the status quo, um, if they're not going for a counter plan or a critique alternative, right? Because if they're going for a counter plan, they'll be like, oh well, you know, we have two options of what to try. So if our option is better, we should try that. Same with the alternative. So this only works when they're going for the disad and the status quo. Right. Now let's say that they have the counter plan. Um, you can't use try or die framing anymore. Um, you have to answer this counter plan as well as the disad. First off is that permutations are, are useful tools, but sometimes we forget about other options and we over-focus on the permutation. Um, the permutation is fundamentally a defensive argument that says that we could do both at the same time. It, um, it doesn't really score points for the affirmative, right? It doesn't say the counter plan is a bad idea or that the affirmative is a good idea. It just says that they could both happen at the same time. So even though permutations are super, super useful, don't get over-focused on them because you have other options, especially other options that are more offensive than the permutation um, against the counter plan. So if you want a solvency deficit to the counter plan, then that unlocks kind of your ability to, to weigh the affirmative impacts against the net benefit or against the disadvantage. Um, because if the counter plan doesn't solve uh, part of the affirmative, right, then that's a uh, that's a disadvantage to, to doing the counter plan, right? So let's say that you're reading the fracking F and you're debating this wetlands counter plan, right? If you're like, you know, wetlands doesn't solve, you know, the water contamination problems and you win that argument, then it means that you get to weigh the environment impact to fracking against the econ net benefit to the counter plan. If they win that there isn't a solvency deficit, that the counter plan solves the whole of the F, well then you're kind of out of luck, right? Um, because if the counter plan solves the whole F, we should probably do that and avoid the econ collapse of, of the net benefit. Once you win a solvency deficit, then that means that your impact calc becomes much more useful um, because if the counter plan solves the F, then it doesn't matter if the F's impacts are more important than the disad because the counter plan solves them. So you need to win solvency deficits in order to get access to your impact calculus. Additionally, you have other options as well that you can that you can start thinking about in terms of external offense against the counter plan, reasons why the counter plan itself is bad, um, or a really important argument that oftentimes um, people forget to make or they don't invest a lot of time in is that the counter plan links to the net benefit. And when we say the counter plan links to the net benefit, it just means that you know whatever link argument that they have about about the net benefit in this case about like environmental regulations that the counter plan would also, for whatever reason, either be perceived by businesses as environmental regulations, or it would have some other uh, impact on, on business confidence, right? And if you win that the counter plan links to the net benefit, then the net benefit is not, they don't get to utilize the net benefit to weigh against the, the AF anymore, um, because it's no longer a benefit to the counter plan. If the counter plan triggers it too, then it's a, now a cost to the counter plan. Finally, you should uh, compare kind of AF solvency specifically and directly to the counter plan to show the importance of the plan. So you need to identify what the differences are between the plan and the counter plan. And then you need to make arguments why that difference, that's actually the key part of solvency, right? So in the fracking versus the wetlands counter plan, right, you can be like, in order to actually solve, we need to address the problem at its source, right? This kind of contamination process instead of just trying to go in afterwards and clean it up. Um, that's a direct solvency comparison that says that 
the counter plan can never solve as much as the affirmative because they're constantly reacting and cleaning up. Whereas the affirmative has more solvency because it, stop, it stops the pollution at its source, right? So you see the different, you identify the difference between the plan and the counter plan. The plan stops pollution at source, the counter plan cleans it up. And then you say, it's actually, that's the thing that's important for solvency, right? And that's how you generate those kind of solvency deficits. Okay. Um, answering the critique. So importantly, when you're debating the critique, um, you'll notice a theme here against all of these negative positions is that you should, should not forget about the affirmative. Um, so when you're answering the criticism, you want to make the debate specifically about the affirmative. Obsessively, you put together the affirmative, you write it for eight minutes in the 1AC, so you think that your affirmative is pretty important, right? That the issues in it are um, significant, that they matter. So even if the negative team is talking about like important things, don't let them distract you from the importance of your affirmative, right? Um, and there's a lot of different, you know, specific arguments that you might make about your affirmative, but ultimately at the, at the end of the day, you need to win that it's important to do the affirmative, to do the plan, to solve your impacts, and that the affirmative is able to accomplish um, kind of those, those goals. Um, additionally, um, you need offense against the critique, right? So you either need a link turn that the plan is actually in the opposite direction from of whatever kind of structure of power they're criticizing or an impact turn, right? Like maybe capitalism isn't the worst thing in the world and it would be really good um, for, you know, the environment or something, um, whatever your impact turn is. Now, some critiques, obviously you can't impact turn in a traditional sense of just saying the bad thing is good, right? Like we don't want to be out here saying, you know, things like, um, racism is good or, you know, um, gender inequality is good, right? But you might impact turn the critique on the level of um, the alternative, right? That the alternative that, they, that they've that they proposed is, uh, you know, is not the right kind of strategy going forward. So they might be focused on interpersonal interactions and the relationships that we have in the room, right? So you might say that kind of focus is bad. We should instead be focused on public policy and institutions, right? So that's a way to impact turn our critique without, you know, having to say like the impact itself is the good thing, right? Because like some things are bad and we don't want to say they're good because they're not, right? So in that case, you want to either link turn and say that you help solve the problem or be like, there's a better approach to solving the problem. We need to be focusing on the kind of institutions and, and government structures and policies that the affirmative is focusing on rather than the language or the um, way that we know or whatever the alternative is talking about. But you need offense, right? You can't just say, no, we didn't do that. That's not us. You know, we're not part of this system. It's inevitable. They can't solve it, right? If you, all of those things are good things to say, but without offense, you know, it just, you just sound defensive. And when you only make defensive arguments, um, again, especially against a critique, then it makes it seem like um, probably the, there's something to be said about the critique, that there's something there. Um, so you want to have offensive arguments and don't be afraid of it. Be like, no, we solved that problem. Or, you know, there's a, the way that they're approaching the problem is bad. And we should approach the problem in the way that the affirmative approaches the world, right? Um, but don't forget about your affirmative. That's the most important part. Oftentimes, when you lose to the critique, it's because you've been bamboozled and you forgot that you had a whole app that you read for eight minutes. Okay. So now we're going to talk about how we win the debate during cross -ex. So this means how do we set up the debate in the questioning period of time that gives us a perception that we're ahead of the game. So first is our confidence during cross-examination and the strategy that we have laid out before round. So for example, B talked about how we usually set up the one and C way before even the first round. But during your pre-round prep, 
that is the time to be writing cross-sex questions about what you want the AF to say that puts you ahead of the game. Example, let's say you are going for a counter plan where you are using a different actor to do the plan because the United States doing the plan or whatever body that we have that controls uh, water protection resources um, doesn't have a good history of regulation. So we're going to have an outside private organization do the plan. Cross-ex should start off with who does the plan, how does it pass, what do those like mechanisms look like, or whatever, and that those answers provide you with kind of leverage when going for those particular positions in future speeches. This also cross ex, it's like a norm in the community that we think of cross ex as a speech. But the difference is, is that some judges don't necessarily take notes or flow during cross ex. So you need to make sure that whatever is said in cross ex makes it into the next speech so that you can carry those answers over and those arguments. Because if you're making smart arguments and you're pigeoning them in a corner or they start making key concessions in cross-ex, if those arguments never make it into a speech, they don't do anything for you in the debate. They're just bright spots that may increase your speaker points, but they're nothing that actually we have tangible on our flow that we can connect the lines throughout each speech and say, okay, yeah, this is something that I can vote on because it was just a 30 second blip in a cross ex period. Next is we'll talk about strategies as a small school. So debate is very much an activity that depends on the success of resources. So that means having access to things like camps, having access to coaches, having access to experienced debaters. And what, because this is a lot of work that we're talking about. This is a lot of information to consume and to think about all year long. So in order to have a successful season, you need resources. And there are some schools out there that like the activity and like what it brings, but they just don't have as many resources to compete at the level that other schools do, which is particularly true why UDLs are good is because it combines all of the resources that you all have as individual programs, and it shares those resources within the Detroit Urban Debate League. So first is knowing the core apps and the core uh, arguments. So if you know the core of the topic and you know how to prepare your generics when you go to national tournaments, it doesn't you don't necessarily need case specific dissats as long as you have case specific links. So that means that you're decreasing the amount of cutting cards or prep time that you will have to use to keep up with people that hire private coaches that just cut evidence for them all day is that you now have a baseline of what it means to compete. Next is knowing what an equalizer looks like in certain tricky situations. So if you are going against a team and you know that they will probably be faster than you, they speak really fast, they have more coaches than you, like they probably cut cards all the time. So what is an argument that equals the playing field? Yes, Victoria. Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, the pers um, so I have a question about the persuasive argument. Um, so when um, 
So in the, in our speech, um, do we have to use words like, for example, and for instance, like words like that? You can use whatever words that you want. I'll get into that later too. That is, okay. uh, give me like two more slides and we'll talk about what judges actually look for um, when they're judging your round. So back to what is an equalizer in a debate with teams that have lots of resources are arguments that you both have access to. So like topicality. Topicality is a definition debate. So you have definitions, they have definitions, and it can be an agreement on what is the core of the topic. And those are things that they can't outcard you on. Those are things that equalize the debate because now we're having a debate about rules and what's fair and like what's the best educational. Those type of debates equal the playing field so that those outside resources aren't necessarily in play. Next is how do we find evidence? So before the season, everybody, most kids, they go to camp and all of the camps upload their evidence to the open evidence project and so that is where we can see what other camps are talking about get an idea of what the season would look like but also there is the high school debate wiki and that is where teams upload their cases or the taglines of their cases if they're not fully open source, which just means that they literally upload the whole document. And it's so that you have an idea of what everyone in the country is talking about so that you can prepare your team. You know, you're like, okay, this is something that I haven't heard about. Let me, let me start researching this. Or you'll be like, okay, this is something I have read. This is a way that other teams have developed it. Let me go and do research into that vein. Or, and it also, sometimes if they have like updates, that cuts out the time that you need to do of making your updates. And the camaraderie that you have as like a UDL decreases the amount of sort of the research that you have to do is because you all are working together. So next we'll do judge adoption. So um, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a link to the Open Evidence Project on the website. If you go to resources, it's the third link um, after the YouTube link and the link to the um, instructional documents. So um, that's the page that has all of the evidence that all of the camps put out um, over the summer. Um, and then if you want to find the high school debate wiki, uh, the easiest way is to just Google high school policy debate wiki. Um, and it's the first response. Well, that's all I want to say. No, thank you for that. Um, next, we have judge adaption. What this means is how do we adapt or change or alter our arguments depending on the judge that we are in front of. So there are three particular components that almost all judges would care about. First is logos, which is logic and reasoning and more of your evidence-based arguments, uh, facts, figures, numbers, science projects, case studies, those type of things. Then there's ethos, which is credibility or ethics, whether it's believable, the track record, uh, your body language, the cadence in your voice, is it soothing, the things that you're doing to perform, because when you speak, it is a performance. And then pathos, which is your emotion, your feeling, the delivery in which you say something. If you're talking about something serious and then you raise your voice five octaves and start yelling, does that delivery match the message that you are trying to send? Or if you are trying to tap into a particular 
emotion within the round or gain people's attention, sometimes we slow our voice down and we make more eye contact instead of reading directly into our computer. These are some things that all judges take into account when making a decision, but some judges value them more than others. So we go forward, we can talk about the differences between a flow judge, uh, a lay judge, and how we tell the difference based off of paradigms. So a flow judge will be characterized as someone who is familiar with the activity, who knows all of the jargon that we talk about and so that there is not that much of a learning curve when being put in the back of a round to adjudicate a debate. So there are also different experiences of flow judge. Like a flow judge can be so we call them flow judges because we assumed that they would take notes during the round. So there are people that frequently judge policy debate but have never competed in policy debate that will probably take notes and follow you coherently but are still not, let's say, a college debater or a college director or someone who has experience of participation, part experience teaching, giving feedback, and all of those other things. A lay judge is coined from the term like layperson, and that is a person who has probably never watched a policy debate before or just your average person in society, they should be able to come into the round and be able to follow the debate. So we should be able, as like people that are communicators, we should be able to debate in front of anyone. So we should be able to have a strategy for a person that kind of follows along with the jargon. And we should be able to have a strategy for a person who has never been in this space before to where that they would understand what is happening. So the way that we find out about this is usually by going to tabroom.com. And at the top tabs, the fourth tab is called Paradigm. And if you click on Paradigm, it pulls up this search judges bar. So when you have pairings, you can type in your judge's name and usually a list of names will come up. So I have mine on the next page of what that would look like. So it shows you when it was updated. So mine was updated in February of this year. And it has like, I, I want to be on the email chain. So I want to be able to look at the evidence that you're reading while you're debating. Some judges might not want that. They don't care. It's a communication activity. They don't want to see anything. They just want you to communicate to them and whatever they follow, they follow. And it has like some of my ideas that I believe to make a good debate or what I think is the purpose of this activity. And so other judges list their thoughts about debate differently so that you or they weigh certain things in the debate more importantly. So now you know, okay, this is what my judge thinks about debate. This is what we should emphasize. So it doesn't mean changing your whole routine. It just means taking cue to what's happening and who you have in the back and what they respond to. So I like to call this debating with sauce. So this means that yes, the way that we present evidence is important, but there's also a style that makes it persuasive. So it's not just what you're saying and all the facts that you're saying, it is kind of having flair to it. It's having charisma, it's taking chances, taking nerves. I like sassy debaters. I like debaters that take chances, that are confident, that like, you know, they come into the round and they're ready to play, they're competitive. And 
I think that that makes me excited to watch the round is because then it's like an intellectual battle. It's like, no, the, both of these teams have come into this space and they know that they have really good evidence and they're, they're willing to talk about it. Like they're willing to get into the nitty gritties and that is enjoyable for me. And I think that that is a beneficial way of like developing just advocacy outside of this round. And so then there's uniqueness. There are some debaters that are just hilarious and they don't try to be. Like they just have witty ways of phrasing things that the way that they move in the round, how they interact with their opponents, it is just a unique style of debate. And then there's just talent. There are debaters that are just good and it comes easy to them. Like this activity is not easy for anyone. It's a lot of information to deploy and to, you think you know something and then you just find out that you don't know anything and you're constantly learning, especially as a novice, it's overwhelming. And so there are some novices, they just get it. They just get it. And so they continue. And then you go to camp and you have these bright spots where a light light bulb clicks and you just get it. And so the combination of all of those things kind of determines the type of debater that you are. So like example, I was a debater. I was probably a sassy debater, but I also had like a, a different type of I talked with my hands a lot. I talked with my hands. I like jewelry. I wear earrings or whatever. Uh, and I'm passionate. So this one tournament, I was speaking. I had on like bangles or whatever. This was an in-person debate. And so I like slammed my fist or whatever on the podium. All my bracelets broke. And so that was chaotic. I never wore bracelets again, but it just determines like if you know your body language and the type of like presentation that you are going to give to an audience, you can kind of anticipate some of those catastrophes or you know how you are presenting yourself in a round that makes it more persuasive, especially when you start debating in out rounds and you have your friends watching you, you have your parents watching you. Like it's exciting to give a performance where people can laugh, people can enjoy the debate and also be mesmerized by like, like how much evidence and how much work that went into preparing this debate. So what happens when the debate is over and how do we strategize around that? So first is knowing, taking all of the feedback that the judges have given you. So when the debate is over, you should be writing notes about what the judge says, why they gave the reason for decision, the parts that they say you can do better at, you should, the parts that they say your opponent should do better at too. So that way that you can prepare a redo speech. So given all of the criticism that your judge gave you, you should be able to rewrite that speech and then give it a winning speech. This doesn't mean you redo it in the round. This is just at practice. So you're like, okay, this is what the judge was looking for. I'm going to add this in and I'm going to give it. And this is going to be the version that would have won me the round. And then it doesn't just stop there because you continue to revise it. You continue to take out filler words. So there are some times we're just like, and, and, or we pause or whatever. And this is a timed activity. So those times that we have using filler words are time that we can be used to layer arguments. Because an argument isn't just like one argument by itself. There's layers and there's components and there's, ways that it interacts with different arguments in the round that makes it so that this is what you want the judge to see when they hear that argument. Next is cut updates. Things are constantly changing in the world. There is not just the way the world is today might not be the way the world is tomorrow or even next week. So when we get our feedback of what's happening in the world, we have to orient our strategy based off of what's 
reflecting outside because when you advocate for the status quo, sometimes in the debate, the status quo isn't the same status quo that it was yesterday or last week or even last month. There are things changing. And next, notify your team. When we are competing, yes, we like individual success. We love speaker awards. We love winning trophies. But the way that we all get better is when your team faces somebody and then they communicate, this is what happened. So this is also why it's important to flow so that you have an accurate like correlation of what happened in the debate. You have an accurate account of what's going on. You notify your team. You say, hey, this is what they said and this was our answer. But now your teammates, they got a little bit more time to prep an answer. You're like, okay, that was good, but we're going to add on to that. Or you'll say, this is how that argument developed. And you'll say, oh, really? That's it? That's all? We can do more than that. We can make this more offensive. So by communicating with your team, with other teams, so don't get discouraged. Yes, this is competitive, but make friends. Be like, what did they say? I want to know. Disclosure is important. All of these things play into account of, guess what? Because once one debate is over, you're back at square one. You're back at the beginning of prepping a one NC or prepping a one AC. So it's like, it's a never, it's like a revolving door. 